Far to the south, in the desolate fortress of Machiris, John the Baptist was still held captive, but even there he had heard of the acts and deeds of Jesus, the man whom he had called the Lamb of God. And when two of his followers came secretly to his cell, John begged them to go to Jesus and ask if he was truly the one who was to come. And obedient to John's request, they undertook the long, arduous journey. Northward they traveled, across the hot, bitter salt shores of the Dead Sea, up the fertile valley of the Jordan, skirting Samaria, coming at last to the Sea of Galilee. Through Canareth they journeyed, Tiberias, Magdala, and at last they came to Capernaum. Do you believe that I am able to do this? Let it be done to you according to your faith. Rabbi, we come from the man, John the Baptist. He is imprisoned at Machiris. But he has no fear. His spirit is as strong as ever. He sent us to ask a question. Ask what you will. He said, seek out the Nazarene, and when you have found him, ask him this. Are you he who was to come, or shall we look for another? Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is he who takes no offense at me. We will tell him, Master. Word for word, as you have told us. Who are those two? Followers of a prophet called John the Baptist. Prophet? A wild man clad in skins, dining on locusts and wild honey? I've heard it said that he was sincere, devout. <laughs> Ranting, raving madman. Enough. What did you go into the wilderness to behold? A reed shaken by the wind? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, those who are gorgeously apparelled and live in luxury are in king's courts. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, who shall prepare the way before thee. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has risen no one greater than John the Baptist. But to what shall I compare the men of this generation? What are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, we piped to you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine. And you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come, eating and drinking. And you say, behold, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Now you are hearing the truth, real truth, not the half-truths of men, men who would weigh us down with a yoke of a thousand laws, laws that we cannot understand. Come to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden light. While the master continued with his mission, his disciples, by two and two, were imparting his teachings to the people of Israel, Thaddeus and James the Less. 
Bartholomew and Thomas, bringing word of a new concept of God's kingdom, of a kingdom in which the living spirit of God ruled by love. They spoke to men of every class and station, to the rich as well as to the poor, to the proud and to the humble, asking not the value of a man's purse, but the worth of his spirit. And the truths that Jesus had taught them, they taught to all who received them, explaining as the Master had explained, patient as he was patient with them, eager to share with all men the story of God's love as they had learned it from Jesus' lips. They were plain men, able to speak simply to plain people, the first missionaries of Jesus. They spoke on the streets and in the homes in the language the humble understood. And as the master had commanded them, they ministered to the sick, the lame, the afflicted. And that's the way my father taught me to make a splice. They never lose a net if you make a splice like that. All that you and Peter say sounds wonderful, Andrew. Too wonderful, I'm afraid. If earning a place in God's favor is as simple as you say it is, why do the scribes and Pharisees trouble themselves with a thousand rules? Mm -hmm. God's rules are simple. It's man's misunderstanding that's made them complex. Oh, yes, but, but surely those who have devoted their lives to following the law and, and every twist of the law should stand first before the Almighty. Oh, Jesus tells us that all men shall be judged by their sincerity, not by their acts. He said that the kingdom of heaven will be like this. A net cast into the sea, gathering fish of every kind. We pull in our nets and separate the good from the bad. Just so will God's angels separate the men. You, me, the scribes, the Pharisees, the whole catch. The good they'll save. The evil, they'll cast away. It'll be as simple as that. Far to the south, John the Baptist's messengers returned to the grim fortress of Machairus on the desolate eastern shore of the Dead Sea. Unharmed, Master? Oh, yes, I am quite safe, quite safe, for the time at least. The whole castle is busy with preparations for Herod's birthday feast. I've been completely forgotten. But now tell me, the Nazarene, did you find him? And what did he say? We saw him at Capernaum. With a great crowd around him. Some sick, some crippled, some blind. And others, scores of others, who follow him from town to town, just to hear his voice. For the first wine, the Damascene, the light Damascene, spiced, of course. Then, I think, the red Bithynian. Then, with the roasted meats, that purple Cyprian. The Romans always love it. No, 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 you fool. Put the incense up there, close to Claudius' chair. He adores the scent. His villa at Capua reeks of it. Ah, well, what do you think? Have I neglected anything? Nothing trivial. Well, I should hope not. Every detail is important tonight. Not only will all my chiefs be here, but the senator from Rome as well. So you have said repeatedly. He is close to Tiberius, very close. If he speaks well of me when he returns to the capital... And do you think one banquet is going to keep him from telling him the truth? That your subjects jeer you, revile your name, threaten open revolt, and all because of one man? Oh, that again. Yes, again. And again and again until you destroy him. You, you, put the taper over there. That corner's blacker than a tomb. Every hour you let him live, the less the people fear you. Spare him another week, even another day. I have no time for it now. My guests are coming. I must see to a hundred things. See to your crown, your kingdom. See what you're about to lose because you fear one man. I do not fear him. You fear his God. I... I must prepare for the senator. A God 
Unable to release him from his chains, a guard powerless to open the dungeon door. Oh, how Tiberius will laugh when the senator tells him that you fear one unarmed follower of such a god. Enough silence. Wait. See that the Princess Salome is prepared to dance for my guest tonight. My daughter dance for your wine-drenched guests? It is my order. I command it. Salome. Stay in your quarters tonight. Do not leave them. But the Tetrarch ordered You me. are my daughter, not his. Do as I say. His thought, not mine. He thought his guests would be flattered if a princess danced for them. The whole country ready to rise because of one man he's too superstitious to execute. And all he thinks of is to flatter his guests. Do you know why he fawns on the Emperor's minions? Because he counts on Roman legions and Roman interest to protect him. He is of the Herodian line, but we aren't, not you and I. But surely they would guard us. Guard us? Why, I would be the first one blamed. The woman the Baptist reviled as the symbol of wickedness? I'd be a scapegoat thrown to the mercy of the mobs. And you with me. No, Mother. Go to him. Plead with him. No. To... No, I've goaded him as far as I dare. But there might be one way. If you did dance tonight, and your dancing pleased him, he would be sure to offer you a reward. A gift as a token of his pleasure. In the presence of such important guests, he would be eager to appear more than generous. He might even offer you your choice of gifts. No. No, Mother. You must. You must. Many who followed you now follow him, but none are certain whence he draws his powers. Do you know, Master? Once before, near the Jordan, I was asked this question. My answer is still the same. No one receives anything except what is given him from heaven. As for the people turning to him, so be it. So be it. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom rejoices in the bridegroom's voice. And therefore, this joy of mine is now full. He must increase. I must decrease. Well, now it is long past time for you to go. I have endangered you holding you this long. Oh, the danger oh, is we are not master. afraid, Master. You have done well. Extremely well. Now I know a greater peace than I have ever known. May the grace of the Lord be with you. And with you, Master. You, Master. Princess, rise and be rewarded for having given enjoyment to my honored guests. You have pleased us. Now it is my pleasure to please you. Name your reward, one worthy of a princess of the Herodian house. Your majesty has been so generous to me already. 
Come, speak up. Your choice of the jewels in my coffer, a villa of your own beside the new palace. Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will grant it. I... I know not what to say, Majesty. <laughs> Take time. Think what you most desire. And on my oath as Tetrarch, whatever you ask me for, I will give it to you. Even to half my kingdom. Go back. Demand his gift before he changes his mind. But what shall I ask? Yes, I am very fond of her, as if she were my own child. And indeed, we are of the same blood. My half-brother Philip is her father, and we are both direct descendants of my father, Herod the Great. Ah, so you've made up your mind so quick. Yes, Majesty. Then speak, and on my oath your desire shall be yours. What shall it be? I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Officer of the guard. Put the prisoner John to death by the sword and bring his head to me. What woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin I lost. Even so, I tell you, there is great joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Master, Master, do you remember us? The men sent to me by John the Baptist. Yes, and welcome. We have come to be your followers, Master. We and these three who have journeyed with us. They were his followers, too. Were? He... He was beheaded by order of Herod Antipas. We carried the body to a tomb. Now, now we would follow you. It is as I said. No greater man was ever born of woman. Their first missionary journeys completed. The Twelve returned to Capernaum where Jesus welcomed them. Now that we're all together again, I have news that John the Baptist is dead. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen a greater prophet than John the Baptist. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a lonely place and rest a while. For well, many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. Reports of Jesus' fame were spreading throughout the land even to the ears of Herod Antipas. The hour grows late, my lord. Have you an appointment with the dawn? I, I have no wish to sleep. 
No. I thought you'd be exhausted. You've slept so little the past weeks. Tossing, turning, muttering in your sleep. I've had bad dreams. Hideous dreams. Was that the messenger from the coast? Oh. What gossip had he from Caesarea? None. He came from the Decapolis. He brought reports on a man, Jesus, a rabbi from Nazareth. Things must be dull in Galilee. That's all the news he had to tell. It is said he speaks with the voice of the Lord. Wipes away the plague with the touch of a finger. Has authority over demons that possess the insane. Oh, really, my lord? And he says that all these tales are true. Well, then he's either a fool or a liar. He is no fool and he would not dare lie to me. The people think the man Jesus is a prophet reborn, Elijah walking the earth again. Or Jonah or Jeremiah. Samaritan folklore. Old wives' tales to frighten children. Perhaps. Perhaps. Yet he said another is coming. He said? Who said? The man whom I had killed. John, they call the Baptist. Oh. Another shall come after me, he said, far mightier than I, with power and judgment of the Lord. John claimed he was sent by God. But his God could not save him from the executioner's sword. Surely that proves he was no holy messenger. And that the God whom he called Almighty had no power to... Enough, enough. It may have been God's will that John should die. Why must you interpret everything as the will of John's God? The God of a conquered people, a God whom only the Jews worship. I am a Jew. My father was ruler of all Israel, I... But you are of the Idumean line, not Israelite. Raised in Greece and Rome, given a worldly knowledge, told of other gods. Why, the Egyptians have a score, the, the Greeks hundreds, the Romans thousands. If you must plead allegiance to a deity, why not one of them? Bow to another god, a different one. Why not? <laughs> yes. Why not? I am of royal blood. I'll choose my own god. Here. Let's pledge him with a toast. Which shall it be, eh? The Romans Jupiter or the Grecian Zeus? Baal of the East or the Egyptian Seth? I do not care. You choose. Your choice is mine. Then I shall name. Shall name? I dare not. The scriptures may be right. But there is only one God. Almighty, supreme, mighty beyond all might. And if there is, and if I have put to death his chosen man... John was not sent by God. His headless body rots in an unmarked grave. But his spirit still lives greater and stronger than before. All that you sought to silence will not be stilled. All that John has prophesied is coming true. Jesus is not Elijah reborn. He is John the Baptist, risen from the dead. That is why these powers work in him. During the days that Herod, fearful and haunted, trembled in his fortress, Jesus continued his earthly mission. He hasn't slept. loved the Baptist deeply. Andrew tells me that they were kinsmen. But no man can go on day after day without his rest. Not carrying the load that he bears, and the continual demands of the people, and now his grief for John. And the fact that Herod may strike at him next. I doubt if he fears Herod. He should. He has a following. And tyrants live in dread of men with followings. But Judas, the master is no threat to Herod. Any leader on the side of truth is a threat to tyranny. 
a danger to Tiberius, the puppets of Rome, Herod, his brothers, to Caiaphas. The master doesn't preach revolt. He talks of love and forgiveness. Yes, I know. But Israel will never be free to love and forgive until her people unite against Rome. Rise to a leader who will guide them, order them, command them to obey. Another tyrant? No, a king. Their own king, a king of Israel. One they will accept as a David, a Moses, a Hezekiah. This is an old, old dream. For three centuries, people have talked of it, but accomplished nothing. But it will come. Not in a year or two or three, perhaps, but when enough men are willing to die for a kingdom of their own. <laughs> I was a zealot. Pledged to restore Israel to its place among the nations of the world. For years, like all the brotherhood, I preached hate and fight and destroy. But now I have heard the master speak of love and forgiveness, and I want more than, than revenge or temporal power or the glories of this world. So do the rest of us and the hundreds that have heard him and the thousands that will. Well, perhaps you're right. Through that night and the days that followed, a great weight lay on the heart of Jesus. The death of John the Baptist meant more than the loss of a beloved kinsman. It marked the ending of the time of the messenger sent to prepare the way. Now the task, the full task, rested on the shoulders of only one, to bring the word of the kingdom to all mankind, to train the men who must carry on the work when he could no longer be with them.